So my talk today is specifically on LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All of you. Now, my philosophy with marketing is that you attract your ideal or your dream clients rather than the constant hustle and work of doing cold outreach of, um, you know, sometimes companies will provide you leads from your, from the main office and those are great, but the best type of marketing is networking and using social media to do that networking. There's a reason they're called social network. And <laughs> I teach you how to use your social medias in the way that they're really intended to start attracting your dream clients. Um, so today in this particular webinar, we are going to go over specifically your LinkedIn account, how to optimize your profile, what connections you should be looking for, how to connect with your target market. And then we're also going to talk about groups. Um, and this is the group segment is really going to be the new part. If you've heard this talk before, I, I've done it lots of times, um, if, especially for I take the lead. So if you've heard this before, groups is going to be where you're going to really get the new bit of information. So show of hands, who here has actually used their LinkedIn profile for literally anything. Used it at all, you mean? Yeah. Have you oh, gotten okay. a job from it? Have you gotten any clients from it? Uh -huh. Who uh -huh. has updated their profile in the last six months? Yeah. A couple of you, right? So when I ask people about their, their LinkedIn, one of the number one things that I hear from them is, oh, I haven't logged in there forever. I don't even know what it says. <laughs> or if I say, you know, have you ever, what is LinkedIn for? People say it's for getting a job. Okay. Well, have you ever gotten a job from LinkedIn? I think I've met two or three people who have gotten a job from LinkedIn. And if your LinkedIn profile isn't getting you a job, if it's not bringing you clients and you haven't even logged in in six months, what is it for? Now, I like to use LinkedIn in a completely different way. I like to use it to actually attract my dream clients. And I do this by optimizing my profile, updating my profile picture, my cover photo, having my actual con contact information there on my profile, my real live phone number. If you go there and you call that phone number on my profile, I'm going to answer the phone. <laughs> Please don't do that all day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, yeah. I have my connections are people who I want to do business with or people who I have done business with. I've gone through my connections and I've taken out the people that are not in my target market. And I've taken out the people who are only on my connections list because I went to high school with them, or I talked to them one time, someplace random, and then they found me on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn profile is speaking directly to my target demographic, who I want to be my client, or people who are in my referral partner network, people who I know can refer me business or people who I can refer business out to. Another thing that a lot of people ignore about their profile is the content. So people don't post on their walls. And this is a huge, huge tool that I'm going to show you how to use that can begin building authority with your audience. So when you are optimizing your profile, there are a few things that you need to ask yourself. Who do I want my profile to speak to? So this goes into who is your target demographic. Now, for Shark Pack Media, I offer a very wide variety of services. I think when I tally it down, I probably offer 15 to 20 different services in my agency. And on my profile, I only list maybe four of those services. And 
I have narrowed down my market to who I want to be reaching out to, who I want to do business with from LinkedIn. Now to determine this, I've done a lot of split testing. I've done a lot of taking off services, adding new ones in. I've done a lot of things that have determined these are the four services that I know I'm creating the best place for on LinkedIn. And these are the only ones I really talk about on LinkedIn. That doesn't mean that the people that come from my LinkedIn profile don't use my other services because just because I don't offer graphic design on my LinkedIn profile, that doesn't mean that people who talk to me once they find out I do graphic design don't hire me for that. It's just the way that I am attracting them. And the best way for you to really start talking to your target demographic is to narrow down one or two things that you want to be targeting. So the other thing is what does my audience think they need? Now, notice I'm not saying, what does my audience really need? <laughs> because oh, yeah. these are two totally different things. Now, my audience, let's, let's talk about the people who hire me for marketing or for sales coaching. What they think they need is more and better clients. Now, I know what they really need is some mindset coaching or some technical coaching. They might need to learn how to write an email sequence. They might need to learn to post on social media. But if I tell you, if I, if I created a program and I said, learn how to write a full email sequence in six weeks, you're going to be like, man, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do that. I know. <laughs> that's not going to attract anybody. <laughs> but if I turn it around and I say, what does my client think they need? They think they need more and better clients. That's what I'm going to say on my profile. I'm going to outline what my client thinks they need. And then that will give me the opportunity to give them what I really know they need. Next is what value do I offer? So if you've ever done any sales training at all, you'll know that you sell, you lead with the value. Because again, if I say, these are all the things that I'm going to show you how to do, that's overwhelming. But if I say, by the end, of the six weeks, you're gonna be able to sell ice to an Eskimo. You're like, heck yeah, that sounds, that's what I need. Give it, right? Take my money. So think about these things when you are filling out your profile. Now, I have created a profile checklist. Now, LinkedIn, just like Facebook, just like Google, just like Bing, is an algorithm. And they show favor to those who have filled out their profile to completion. And you might've noticed if you've logged into your profile, there is a little progress bar that says how complete your profile is. Now, completing your profile earns you points when somebody searches for the services or the key phrases or words that are listed on your profile. And Key phrases and words are really important and we'll go over that in a little bit. But if you don't complete your profile, then your profile will show after those who have completed theirs, whether you're using good keywords or not. So number one is your profile picture. Your profile picture should be professional to your industry. So for example, in my industry, a basic headshot with a plain background is not really common. So I'm using a professionally taken photo that is a me. I have a nature-ish background and it's professional. I've also had pictures on there that were not professionally taken. I took them with my cell phone and I made sure that I had a nice background behind me. I've even had a picture of me sitting here at my desk, especially right now, because this is how people see me all the time. <laughs> so this is how I'm recognizable. This is also what's considered standard in my industry. 
Now, if it's standard in your industry to have that professional suit and tie headshot, then do that. But it should never be a candid selfie like the kind you would use on Facebook. It should never have another person in there because who is this profile really about? And it should be recent. If you've had a major physical change recently, or did you go from blonde to brunette? Did you grow a beard? Have you recently lost 100 pounds or gained 100 pounds? You need a new picture to show who you are today. If somebody met you in person after friending you or following you on LinkedIn, or they get on Zoom with you, they should be able to recognize you from your profile picture. It shouldn't be a surprise when they see who you are today. Next is your headline. So this is where you are going to really begin to utilize your keywords or key phrases. So on my headline, I have business growth expert, certified life coach, web developer, lead generation expert. That's it. Notice I don't have CEO of SharpTech Media or co-owner SharpTech Media. Now, the reason this is, is because CEO Sharp Tech Media means literally nothing to anybody but me. And your profile is no longer about you. It's about what you offer the people who come to visit. Now, this serves two purposes. It tells people the services that you do offer. And it gives you those key phrases in the LinkedIn search engine. If somebody goes into LinkedIn and types in certified life coach, I'm going to be right there. They're going to see my profile. They're going to come and check it out. And they're going to see everything that I have to offer in regards to being a certified life coach. Next is your contact info. Again, this should be your for real contact info, your real phone number, your real email address, your real Skype, if you have it, people should be able to reach out to you to do business. That's how client attraction marketing works. So when people reach out to you, you should answer the phone. You should respond to their messages. And I know this feels like I'm being Captain Obvious, but there are so many people who don't actually do this. They have a bogus phone number or they have a phone number and it goes straight to voicemail. People don't like leaving voicemail. And if they call you because they're interested in working with you and they get your voicemail, they're just gonna skip it. They're gonna say, never mind. They're gonna lose their nerve. So you want this to be a way that people can genuinely get in contact with you. Next is your about info. So this section is an area where you can elaborate on the services that you offer. It should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, in the beginning, you need to be talking about you, what you can do. This is why you're here. This is a little bit about you, where you came from. The middle is the value. This is where you are going to start letting people know what you can do for them. And the end is the why. Why should people now take action, call to action? Why should people get in touch with you? It doesn't have to be long. I say anywhere from three to 500 words. Anything more than that, people are gonna get bored and they're going to quit reading unless you are an amazing storyteller. And then by all means, share your stories. Most people will not read that far. So you want to get to the point very quickly and you want to have a big impact on the value that you can give them. Next is your experience and certifications. Now, your LinkedIn profile is not your resume. All that should be here is what makes you qualified to do the job you are claiming you can do for people. It doesn't matter anymore where you went to high school. 
It might matter where you went to college if your degree matters in your field. Obviously, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, it kind of matters if you are a licensed professional who can legally do the job. It might matter your certifications if they are relevant to the job you're doing right now. But everything else can be put to the side because you no longer need to tell people your whole life story on your certifications. Pull out the things that make sense for the job you're claiming you can do. Next is your testimonials. Now, this one is very valuable. And if you have testimonials, I would encourage you to ask people to leave them. However, it is not a make or break type situation. I have one testimonial on my profile and I still get lots of business from LinkedIn because I have testimonials on other networks and other places online. However, if you do have a lot of testimonials on LinkedIn, it does help you attract more clients it helps you attract more referral partners. Now, when people are referring you business, they want to know that you are qualified and that you're going to do a good job for the people they refer business from. So having testimonials can be incredibly valuable. And lastly is content. This is the part that almost everybody skips because content can be work and People don't know what to write. Hey, Deb, you're talking about on the uh, experience. I know some people, they'll have their current position and they have every position they've had for the last 15 years. Oh, yeah. And right. you, you're With talking 30. about it's not a resume. <laughs> if you're looking at somebody and you see they've switched industries a dozen times, aren't you going to be less likely to want to contact them for their current one? Right. That's true. And it doesn't really matter. The fact is, is people don't care. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like harsh, but people only want to know that you can do X job, right? Right. It doesn't matter to them where you worked before. I mean, it might matter to them how many jobs you've had before if you seem unreliable, right. but right. it doesn't really matter where you went what groups you were in in college or where you went to high school or those things are completely irrelevant to how good you can do your job now and well, the other the other quick question is then on the uh the the job title since we're still on this whole area i find that i see a small business owner i like to see that they're the owner but if i see somebody that has a uh, business they've had for six months and they say they're CEO, president, oh, yeah. and founder, uh, it seems a little much to me. Right. And the other thing too is in that section, I like to use the services that I'm providing for that section because right. in the about section is where I say I founded Sharp Tech Media right. in 2007, right? Gotcha. If somebody finds my profile using those keywords, because those were in my headline, they're likely going to continue reading on a little bit more about me. And they're going to see right there that I'm the owner. And if they did a basic Google search about my company, they would see that I was the owner. They'll see my website. They'll see me, my picture that looks like just like me on my website. Right. So, Sometimes it doesn't really matter to necessarily say those things because if you are working on your marketing and your marketing is consistent and in alignment with the type of people that you are attracting into your business, then those things are going to become very obvious very quickly. So Deb, uh, an easy way to think about this is if the experience section is written in the third person, the about section is written in the first person. Right. Correct? Right. So think about the experience section. 
as about your company or your whatever entity you have. And the about section is personal. It's personal branding. That's right. And I'll go back on mute because uh, I want to hear what you have to say rather than uh, chime in every two <laughs> seconds. OK. Is there any other questions around profile optimization? OK, we are going to move on. I have a quick question. Oh, OK, sure. Yeah, so uh, I guess uh, when people are, I know that there's tools for people to find uh, uh, resources. So like, would you, so I'm a chemical engineer and I'm a process and product development engineer. The thing is, is that in like one part of the profile when they're searching for jobs, they're gonna say it requires chemical engineering and another part, the job description is probably gonna be process and product development engineer. Mm -hmm. And I have enough of those titles that could literally go eight lines. Um, and so I like always struggle with saying, well, if I want this type of client, I would need to have this at the top. If I want that type of client, I'd want to have that at the top. Uh, is there a way that I could figure out which ones would push me higher up on the list? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. And the way that you're going to figure that out is honestly by just testing. So ah, what that's I a good did idea. to determine my key phrases that I'm using on my profile is I go through cycles and I change them. So say okay. I'm really trying to narrow down where I'm going to get the best results. I will completely change my headlines or I will completely change my about section. And I will data, I am as an engineer, I am all data. So I will keep a crazy person spreadsheet about how many views my profile got, about how many people I chatted with, how many people found me organically, how many people saw X article that I posted on X date. And I will narrow it down and say, okay, I'm going to switch out this headline, this part of my headline and determine where I'm getting the most business, which audience is the most receptive. Now, determining that first test, that first group test is literally a coin toss. I mean, you could eeny, meeny, miny, mo it and decide how you're gonna start. But the important part is that you start <laughs> because getting overwhelmed and just saying, okay, well, I don't know what to do, so I don't, is way worse than starting with your least effective key phrase or keyword. Does that make sense? Yep. Excellent. Thanks, Deb. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about content. So what does your target market find the most valuable? And again, this goes back to what they think they need. So what are the things that you have to offer? What is the value that you bring to the table that your target audience wants to know more about? What is going to compel them to take action or what is going to compel them to want to get to know you more? Using multiple media formats is really going to be your friend. Sometimes people hate reading. Now I read every single thing I see on the whole internet. This is like my entire day is getting <laughs> sidetracked on articles and posts online. <laughs> Some people hate reading. They will watch videos. They'll listen to podcasts all day long, but they can't stand to read anything more than a hundred words. So what you're doing when you are using multiple media formats is you are targeting every audience, regardless of how they consume media, how they learn, how they get to know people. The other thing that you're doing when you are using multiple media formats is you are expanding how much content you are able to create. Because I can write one single article. Let's say my article is 500 words. I can now turn that article into a video. I can turn that same article into a podcast. I can turn that same article into a 200 character post with a picture. I have now provided myself with content for nearly every day of the week. And I only had to write one article. So 
I've created a system for myself that's doable because I'm really busy. I run two complete whole full-time businesses. I don't have time to just sit around and write all day. So I've created a system that is sustainable for me that I know that I can commit. I can commit to writing one single article a week. And that allows me to continue taking action. And it allows me to continue posting new content all the time. What that does is that builds rapport with my audience. It shows people that I am consistent and reliable. It also allows people to get to know me. Now, some of my articles are very technical. They're all business front to back. Then some of my articles are not necessarily technical at all. They're just about me, getting to know me, stories that I've had along the way. Right? I've been in business a really long time. And those personal stories allow people to connect with me on a personal level and say, hey, she's my people. I want to work with her. I want to be in her energy, right? And that is what social media is really all about, is allowing people a glimpse into who you are. Because there are a bajillion, a jillion life coaches and digital marketers on the internet. They're everywhere. Yeah. And thinking that people are going to do business with me if I'm not giving that personal aspect, it's going to be a coin toss on if they're gonna to wanna to do business with me because why? Why should they work with me over the next person? Now, the reason why is because as they look at my content, as they get to know me, they agree with what I have to say. They like my energy. They like my teaching style. They like the fact that I have the same views and values as they do. So creating content and being personable with it gives people that glimpse of who you are and how you're going to do business with them. The other thing with your content is making sure that you are posting all across LinkedIn, not just on your wall. So next we are going to be talking about groups. And this is going to be another place where you can post content to reach an even wider audience. Now, groups is one of the least utilized sections of LinkedIn by most people. But there are over 1.7 million groups on LinkedIn. Wow. And some of those groups have tens of thousands of people. Your connections with LinkedIn are in stages. So I'm sure you've seen the little numbers next to your connections on LinkedIn. So you have first level connections, second level, third level. Your first level connections, you can communicate with these people freely. You can send them a DM, you can post on their walls, you can connect with them in any way that you see fit. Your second level connections are people connected to your first level connections, but not you. So these people, you can send a connection re request to, but you cannot DM them. You can send them an in message, but I think you only get like five or 10 in in mail messages on any profile. And they're not as valuable as DMs. And then you have your third level connections. These are people connected with your second level connections, but not your first or yourself. Now these people, you can only send an in mail message to. You can't send them a connection request unless you have sent them an in mail message and they have responded. And they're not as accessible as your second or first level connections. However, if you are in a group with somebody even if that person isn't your first, second, or third level connection, you can still send them a DM. Hmm. Now, the reason this is, is because LinkedIn has decided, oh, these people are in a group together. That means they must have something to talk about. And it opens that door for you to connect with them. And even if you don't want to send them a DM, they will still see your post in the group. 
now you're spending time creating this amazing content and you're only posting it to your wall and only the people who follow you who happen to look at their feed around the time when you posted it are going to see that content. So now you can take that content and you can post it in a group. Now, not only the people who are in your connections are going to see it, but also everybody in this group is going to see it. And you're going to get an opportunity to reach a wider audience. The other thing that groups allow is it allows you to connect with people on a more personal level. Because when other people post in groups, this gives you an opportunity to comment on their post. Now, you'll notice on LinkedIn that comments on post is not as plentiful as it is on Facebook or Instagram or any of the other social medias. And that's what makes them so much more valuable. People want to be seen and heard. Period. It's human nature. And when you simply comment great post, thanks for sharing, it makes that person who worked so hard on that content feel seen and heard, especially if you're the only one who commented. They're going to remember you. They're going to want to talk to you now when you send them a DM. You can send them a DM and say, hey, thanks for sharing that post. It really spoke to me or it really helped me a lot. I really appreciate you sharing. This is a reason to open the door. This is a reason for that person to let their guard down and get to know you. And you are making this person feel special because they're being seen and heard. So treating people like human is probably the number one biggest step in this whole process. Because we forget sometimes that there are real life people on the other side of post and bringing it down to that simple basic fundamental fact that these are real people who are in these groups and these are real people who post things and allowing people to get to know us reminding people that we are people we're human and we want to be seen and heard as well will begin to build those fundamental relationships using social media that is going to start attracting people to do business with you. Now, with the groups that you should be joining, there are a number of things that you need to consider. Number one is who is this group for? Is this group for people who are in your target demographic or is this group for people who are good referral partners for you? Now, there are some groups where you will quote unquote, not belong. A good example of this is I am a part of a couple bookkeeper groups. Now I'm not a bookkeeper, but bookkeepers are great referral partners for me because they work with small businesses and small businesses are my target demographic. And when I'm in these groups, I don't share content that is by my thing, by my thing, right? Because mm -hmm. I want to share content that bookkeepers can share with their clients. That's going to make them look good because nobody in that group is gonna buy my thing. But <laughs> everybody in that group could refer me business. And I'm looking to build those relationships with them that can turn that relationship around. I also ask questions in those groups that I can help my client, maybe even questions that I have for real, because I'm not a bookkeeper. I'm like other end of the spectrum. So I ask questions that allow people to help me. This brings value to the group. This brings value to people individually because they feel good when they can be helpful. And then I can take that information and I can actually share it with my clients who have questions for me. People ask me business questions like that all the time and I have no, I have no answer, I don't know. I'm still counting on my fingers and toes when I'm trying to add things. So I can now have content that I can bring value to my clients 
I've brought value to the group by asking questions. And I've brought value to people individually by making them feel helpful, human, seen and heard. So groups is one of the most valuable things that you can add to your repertoire. And avoiding groups that are just uh, like maybe alumni groups and things like that, those are not really going to be very helpful because they're not in your target demographic and they're not in your referral network that of people who you want to refer you business. So figuring out number one, who you want your profile to target, doing that research, finding out with split testing who you're going to be targeting is number one. Then number two is joining groups that serve that purpose. So Deb, just a quick question. Jo now you join bookkeepers groups and they don't mind that you're not a bookkeeper and you've joined? I mean, do they feel, so, yeah. Sometimes, that is a great question. Yeah. Sometimes I have been kicked out of groups. Moderator will come in and they'll be like, um, you don't belong here or okay. just straight denied. So that does happen. Okay. Usually what will happen is there will be a little comment box that'll say why you want to be in this group, right? And it'll have like a prerequisite, like, are you a bookkeeper? Yes or no, right? And then why you want to be in this group. Okay. Now, what I would put in that section is I want to be in this group so that I can learn more about the questions that my clients are asking me. Oh, I want to be in this group so I can refer business to bookkeepers because I have, I work with small businesses. Now, be honest on why you're there. Make it clear that you are not there to sell anything. You're there to learn. You're there to connect. You're there to refer business, right? Because you are there to refer business and you're also there to get business referrals. So be humble. Don't, I mean, obviously nobody is going to go and let you in if you're like, I'm here to, I'm here to get more business. Like, okay, well, bye. That, they're not going to let you in at all. Right. So think of a way to phrase it that you think they will let you in. And sometimes they won't. And that's okay. You just move on to the next group. Um, and sometimes pe they'll kick you out later when they, re when they like are moder <laughs> like modeling the group and they're like, okay, this person doesn't really belong here. And there have been times where I've tried, I've reapplied or I'll DM the admin and say, Hey, you know, I get a lot of value from this group and I'm never spammy, you know, just be humble. Mm -hmm. And usually people will just let you back in because they're human. Keep in mind, every, these are real people. Yeah. And when you treat them like real people, they react as such. And everybody, not everybody is super nice, but most people they're pretty nice. And when you say, you know, Hey, I promise I'm not spamming. I'm just here to learn. They'll let you back in. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. So I'd like to open up for questions. Um, I, I left a little bit of time for questions because I know last time we had quite a few. So I want to open up now for any questions that you had along the way, if you didn't get a chance to speak up. Hi Deb, I have one. Can you tell us what the difference in value between having the standard LinkedIn versus premium? So I have had both. And the benefit that I got from using the premium LinkedIn is you can send out more direct messages on the premium LinkedIn. The new premium LinkedIn is targeted to marketers and you can send several hundred DMs on the new one. Um, you also can organize people like a CRM and you can't do that with the, the basic version of LinkedIn. Um, I haven't had a premium version for more than a year now and I'm still doing just fine. I still get business all the time from LinkedIn. I found that I'm not doing cold outreach anymore. So I don't really need that benefit of being able to send more than however many, they don't really have a rule on how many DMs you can send. They just decide when they think you've sent too many. I've sent 200 DMs in a day and before I got the finger wag and then I've sent like 10 in a day. <laughs> wow. So 
Um, and they also don't say like, you're gonna go to LinkedIn jail for however long, right? They just, sometimes it's a couple days and sometimes I've been in, DM, in uh, LinkedIn jail for like a month before. Wow. Um, so it's, it's really, they have their terms. It's very much up to their discretion. Um, but if you're not sending a whole bunch of DMs and you don't really need the CRM aspect of organizing everybody and doing like in-depth search results um, and metrics, then I don't really see a lot of value in it, to be honest. So when you post in the standard LinkedIn, is it just your first level contacts that see that? Right. When you post, only the people who are your first level connections can see that. Okay. Um, however, when your second level connections come to your profile, they can see your activity on there, um, but they're not gonna see it like on their wall. Are business pages used in LinkedIn? Um, I don't think so. I, I've never been asked that question before, so I honestly have never thought about it. I think that LinkedIn as a whole is kind of used as one giant business page, so they don't really utilize they don't really utilize the business page like they do on Facebook. I was in a networking group where they were talking about having the business page or profile on LinkedIn for mm -hmm. the group. I'm going to have, I'll look more into that um, because I haven't really come across that specifically having a business page. Um, I do have a LinkedIn profile for my business, um, mm -hmm. but I don't really use it to be honest. I mean, I post on it and I, you know, it's active, but I get the most business from my personal profile and that personal connection that people get with me. Thanks. Well, and it's the same with your Facebook as well for you right. personally, yeah. So I have a quick question regarding um, content. You mentioned posting um, podcasts, uh, uh, articles, and video. How do you do you delay? You know, do you put any kind of delay uh, in between uh, posting each of those, or do you post all three at the same time? How do you work that? So usually what I'll do is at the, at the beginning of the week or sometimes over the weekend, I'll write my article, right? And then I decide, okay, this week I'm going to post my whole article on this day. And then the next day I'll post the, a little excerpt from it with a picture. And then the next day I'll post the podcast version or the video version of it. So I... What I do is I mix it up. I don't post at the same time every day. Um, and I don't post the same thing every week. So I don't post this, an article every Monday. And the reason I do that is because the algorithm kind of can put you in boxes mm. and they'll say, oh, this person only posts articles on Monday. So then it's gonna show your article only to the article readers on Mondays, right? And what I want is I want to get the biggest reach possible. So I want people to see all the different media mediums that I have to show. I don't want to get put into the algorithm box. And that's kind of a whole nother lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good questions and yeah. answers, of course. So yeah. So good. Um, if any, if, does anybody else have any questions? If you do, just unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask Deb. Deb, how I, do you decide what groups you want to go after? Do you just uh, come up with topics and start searching those groups? Yeah. And is so, there a way to spot a group that looks like a better group than us? Let's say you find three bookkeepers groups. Can you tell by looking at them based on that? Uh, who's more active? Who's more likely to be a decent group to join? Right. So the groups will show how many people are in the group and it will also show how many posts how many new posts today or something of that nature right. that group has so you want to be in a group that is more active yeah. and you want to be in a group that has more members um, being in smaller groups can sometimes have its benefit depending on what your industry is because then you might get more exposure 
to a smaller group of people who are more likely to take action. But as a general rule, it's better to be in bigger groups because then your reach is larger, right? You get to DM more people, you get a more people seeing your content mm -hmm. and you get to interact with more people in the comments because remember groups are not only for you to spread your content around, but it's for a place where you can connect with people on a more personal level through the comments. Um, and figuring out what groups you should join is really going to be sitting down and figuring out who you want your referral network to be. Who are the best people that can refer you business and who you can refer business to because it's a give and take, right? When you refer out business, more business is referred back to you. And that's something that we learn here at I Take the Lead is that giving is, is receiving. So figuring out who those people in your network are that are going to be the best partners for you is going to be the groups that you should be joining. Great, great. Makes total sense. Yeah, good. So Lee, you had a question for Deb? Oh. Uh. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, you muted, yeah. I did and then remuted myself, nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I was trying to think of an example of the bookkeeping thing for me and I I couldn't. Like I, I do engineering consulting to mostly to manufacturing companies, right? So I could target other people that are in those manufacturing industries, but I can't think of like what I target would I look for people that were working within finance within the manufacturing group or I don't. So who are the people, who are the other people that manufacturing companies would hire? My competitors. Other than in the <laughs> industry. So do they need virtual assistants for managing digital inventory? Do they need bookkeepers do they need um people who have more managerial skills do they need financing so figuring out the other people that your clients hire to make their business run as a whole those other people are going to be your referral partners well, I suppose you could take a look at the people you like to work with and contacts you've had success with and just go see if there are any groups and just start that way. That's, That's true. Work backwards and say, what groups are they in? And you might, if you go to 10 clients, you might see a similar type of group and that gives you a lead of which way to go. Right. Another thing that you can do as well is ask your clients. Just say, hey, I'm doing some market research. Who are the key vendors or who are the key components that keep your business running? They'll right. tell you. Yeah. I've never you're... had a client be like, uh, no, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> if you look at somebody's profile, can you see what groups they do belong to? I haven't tried that. Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good idea is going in and seeing what groups they're a part of as well. Um, the other thing too is asking on your, on your wall or even within group, other groups that you are already a part of, say, you know, I'm doing some market research. I want to figure out who I can refer business to. This is what I do. A bajillion people will say me if you are their referral partner because they want you to refer them business. So if you're working with their clients and they've already figured all this stuff out, let them tell you. Hmm. <laughs> well, good, so I can't see everybody, let's see. Um, so does anybody else have any questions, Tim? Jackie, Jonathan, Loretta? <laughs> I, I have a question. I, I missed the first part of the webinar, so I hope I, I am not asking something that was already covered, but uh, I work in a very similar industry as Lee uh, and do 
uh, performance-based contracting. And generally the person that everyone wants to talk to is the owner of the building because nobody's going to spend a dollar that if they don't own the building to, um, to do the work. And once I am in contact with somebody at that, that works in the building, how do I work my way up to the person who the, makes those final de decisions? So typically with this particular method, um, if you watch the replay, you'll be able to see at the beginning, the style of marketing that we're doing here is a little bit different from doing cold outreach or trying to find that head person because we're going to be optimizing our profile to speak to our ideal client. So if your ideal client is the owner of a particular business or a particular building, then that is something that you would state clearly on your profile. Then we are going to be providing content and building an ourselves as an authority in our industry, telling people what we do, letting people get to know us a little bit. And then through that, we are going to begin finding by way of attraction, those connections who we want to be talking with. So when you're doing your market research and you're finding people who work with your ideal client, those are going to be your referral partners. They're going to connect you directly with those people because you're no longer having to work your way from the bottom to the top. These people are already working with them, right? Because somebody is working with them, whether it's their finance person, whether it's their bookkeeper, whether it's their virtual assistant, whether it's anybody who's already working with the top guy, the head person, they are going to now refer this business to you because they already know that you need to talk to them. You've already built yourself as an authority with your content on social media and you've already built this relationship with your referral partner. So you're not going to have to work your way from the bottom to the top through DMs and through searching for people. I, I have one uh, for you, Jonathan. If you actually really want to get in the contact for something like a facility, you should be able to look up who the responsible person is for environmental permitting, and that'll always be the site manager every time and it's public record. So if you have an address and a company name, you can find it for any company and you'll have like required by law, you have to have phone numbers and stuff to contact them. So. Well, th thank you. Thanks, Jonathan and Lee. And I want to mention to everybody, I forgot to mention this, um, you're on here. We will be set, I'll, I'll be sending out the recording for this so you'll get the entire presentation sometime later today or tomorrow so um so thank you thank you everybody for your questions and i think deb wants to share her her special with us yeah uh, so can i sure go ahead can i ask one more question yes. is, is there any other tips you have to keep people from like just like blocking you stopping not following you like is there a you said you do your posts a little bit more randomly then on a specific day or like to keep LinkedIn from pushing you down? What do yeah. you do with that? So number one is understanding that it's not personal if somebody decides to unfriend you or unfollow you or anything, right? Maybe they don't have the capacity to talk to people right now. Maybe they already have all the clients in the world and they don't need any new ones. Or maybe they just don't understand how social networking works. And number two is obvious. Don't be offensive. Don't be rude. Don't be a hound. People don't like those things. People don't like getting 7,000 DMs and that have literally no relevance to them that are copy paste from 700 other people that you DM'd be human. Just remember that these are real people on the other side of this and you are a real human. You're not a robot. And think about what you would want somebody to say to you or what you would want somebody to send you. So if you have an article to share and you know who that person is because you did your research, you found out who the person that you want to talk to is, and you wrote an article that might be relevant to them, send it to them. 
say, hey, I just wrote this article. I think you might find valuable. And there's actually a little button when you write an article that says, send this article to your connections or something like that. And it allows you to select the people that you want to send that to from your DM list. That is a good way to get your face in front of people who you want to be in front of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a human way to do it because this article is genuinely relevant to this person. They would genuinely find it valuable. And when they look at it, they'll see that very clearly. Um, but for the most part, when you keep that in mind, just being human, being a normal person, the number of people who block you or unfollow you is very, very small because people want to be seen and heard. And when you make them feel that way, they remember and they like you. Well, good. <clears throat> then I have one more question. So if I'm on a, a contact of mine, um, how do I tell what um, groups they're in? Off the top of my head, I cannot answer that question <laughs> without going and actually looking myself looking right at, now. Yeah. Um, I can, because when you mentioned it, I went to your profile to see what groups you're part of and started okay. joining some of them. So you just go to the person's individual profile and scroll down. It shows the groups that they're connected with. Yeah. So okay. if they don't have any, it means that they don't have any. <laughs> right. 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 So I'm going to end it there and let Deb give her, uh, you know, sh share the end because we are over time. So, um, okay. so no more questions. <laughs> so, but thanks, everybody. So Deb, go ahead. So I am offering everybody here a one hour strategy call. This is different from my normal 15 minutes that I usually give people wow. for free. So this is really valuable um, because I don't give anybody a whole hour free strategy sessions anymore. No. Um, so I'll post my info below. It'll have my calendar or in the comments, it'll have my calendar link for you guys to sign up um, or you can send me an email or text me. Text is probably easier than a call. Um, and I'll, this is my real cell number, real contact info. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, go ahead and message me. Let me know what you want to go over. We can go over anything from mindset, sales strategy, um, doing some research on who your target audience what is. That was a big question mark here on this call. So if you want to go over that, I can help you guys strategize on who your target market might be. Um, and we can go over marketing any business that you have or any questions that you have around your business. It doesn't just have to be the one that you represent here at ITILI. It can be literally anything you want. Well, very good. Well, thanks, Deb. That, that was, that was cool. outstanding. Yeah, very good. That's, lots of great information. And yeah. I, I know we all got a lot of value, so thank you. Excellent. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So good. Well, um, glad to have everybody here, and uh, nice seeing you all. We had. It's, I, I know Jackie had said she had to go. Um, Couple people had meetings and had to jump off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were a few people that said that. So, um, but I, I will be sending out the replay, so you'll ha all have Deb's information and everything if you didn't catch it. So thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. And I hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank bye you, bye. everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.